Donald Trump found some votes in Georgia. They just weren't the ones he was looking for. You know, it's not every day that the former president of the United States gets charged with multiple felonies. Or no, I guess at this point it is uh, every day, it seems like. But a Georgia grand jury indicted former President Donald Trump, charging him with felony racketeering and several conspiracy charges as part of a sweeping investigation into his attempts to overturn the 2020 election. The 41 count indictment also names 18 additional defendants, including legal luminaries like Sidney Powell, Jenna Ellis, John Eastman, Kenneth Cheesebro, and Jeffrey Clark. Also among the indicted is Rudy Giuliani, who himself pioneered the use of RICO charges to go after the mob back when he was US attorney. This thing is incredibly ironic. Well, 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 how the turntables. So let's break down the Georgia indictment. And as a reminder, the indictment contains unproven allegations. Just because the grand jury voted to indict, all that means is that they believe that there was probable cause that a crime may have been committed. That is a far cry from the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt that the prosecutors will need to prove at trial. But the Fulton County indictment echoes the DC indictment by starting with the premise of quote, Trump and the other defendants charged in this indictment refused to accept that Trump lost and they knowingly and willfully joined a conspiracy to unlawfully change the outcome of the election in favor of Trump. Trump and 18 alleged co-conspirators have been accused of 41 different counts. Now, not all of the co-defendants are accused of having committed the same crimes. Trump himself has been accused of 13 of the 41 counts. More on that later. Count one is for violating the Georgia RICO statute. Basically, the way that this indictment is written is that the co-defendants engaged in several different general schemes in perpetration of 40 different counts, each of which functions as a predicate for count number one, RICO. But let's start with the predicate offenses that Trump is charged with committing. A predicate offense is a type of crime that is related to another crime. In this case, the big crime is racketeering in violation of Georgia's RICO statute. And to violate RICO, a person must engage in a pattern of racketeering activity. Now, not every crime can be a predicate crime for Georgia RICO, and the law lists 43 specific crimes that can qualify under the law that can be used as a predicate act. But many potentially apply here. False statements and writings, impersonating a public officer, forgery, filing false documents, influencing witnesses, computer theft, computer trespass, uh, computer invasion of privacy, and conspiracy to defraud the state, and acts of theft and perjury. And in the indictment, prosecutors listed 161 acts that they say prove that a violation of the RICO Act occurred. Among the acts uh, include things like accessing Dominion voting machines and influencing witnesses. Not all the acts are crimes on their own, and the indictment cites several Trump tweets, for example. And when asked whether a tweet can be a crime, Willis said that the tweets are, quote, alleged to be acts taken in furtherance of the conspiracy. Many occurred in Georgia, and some occurred in other jurisdictions and are included because the grand jury believes they were part of the illegal effort to overturn the results of Georgia's 2020 presidential election. Now, this is very similar to the rules regarding normal garden variety conspiracies, which we covered in the context of the DC indictment. Crimes are often made up of smaller non-criminal acts. Buying a gun is legal. Buying a gun as part of a criminal conspiracy to rob a bank is illegal. Telling lies is legal. Telling a lie as part of a conspiracy to defraud someone is illegal. But that's how you get really dumb legal takes like this tweet, things that are apparently illegal in America, tweeting that you're watching TV, reserving rooms for meetings, asking someone for a phone number, which is not only a dumb legal take, it was actually stolen from somebody else. Uh, but at least it gave rise to one of the greatest tweets from Internet Hippo. New right wing thing is describing crimes as generically as possible to pretend like they're not crimes. Someone gets convicted of conspiracy and they start yelling, wow, so it's illegal to make plans with friends now. But as both crimes on their own and as predicates for RICO, the indictment alleges several different schemes. Uh, there are some similarities with the various schemes with the DC indictment, but there are also differences. The first is the fake electors plot. The indictment alleges that co-defendant Mike Roman, who worked for the Trump 2020 campaign as director of election day operations, helped organize slates of phony Trump electors purporting to represent the electoral votes from battleground states, including Georgia. On November 30th, 2020, Roman instructed an unindicted co-conspirator to quote, coordinate with the individuals associated with the Trump campaign to contact state legislators in Georgia and elsewhere on behalf of Donald Trump and to encourage them to unlawfully appoint presidential electors from their respective states. This allegation shows that the effort to send false certificates to NARA and Congress was highly coordinated by people connected to Trump. On December 3rd, 2020, Giuliani, Ellis, Stallings, and Eastman met with members of the Georgia Senate 
uh, who were present at a Senate Judiciary Subcommittee meeting and solicited them to violate their oaths of office by unlawfully appointing presidential electors from Georgia. During the hearing, Giuliani made two false representations that at least 96,600 mail-in ballots were counted in the November 3rd, 2020 presidential election in Georgia, despite there being no record of those ballots having been returned to a county elections office, and that Dominion Voting Systems equipment used in the November 3rd, 2020 presidential election in Antrim County, Michigan, mistakenly recorded 6,000 votes for Joseph R. Biden when the votes were actually cast for Donald John Trump. During the hearing, defendant Ray Smith, an Atlanta lawyer, made six misrepresentations about election fraud, such as claims that 66,248 underage people illegally registered to vote before their 17th birthday. While Trump was tweeting, Ken Cheesebro was organizing the fake electors in battleground states. On or about the 11th day of December, 2020, he sent an email with attached documents to Mike Roman. The documents were to be used by Trump presidential elector nominees in Georgia for the purpose of casting electoral votes for Trump, despite the fact that Trump lost Georgia. Defendant James Schaefer, who was then the chairman of the Georgia Republican Party, oversaw a December 2020 meeting at the state capitol of 16 GOP electors who signed documents falsely claiming Trump won. Schaefer and several other defendants created a document entitled Certificate of the Votes of the 2020 Electors from Georgia, with knowledge that said document contained the false statement, we the undersigned being the duly elected and qualified electors for president and vice president of the United States of America from the state of Georgia, do hereby certify the following. Trump and his co-defendants included the fake certificate in a legal filing. And then there was the attempt to call a special legislative session. On December 5th, 2020, Trump called Governor Brian Kemp and allegedly solicited, requested, and importuned Kemp to call a special session of the Georgia Georgia General Assembly. Oh, so like we're not supposed to importune people anymore. I thought this was America, huh? Isn't this America? I'm sorry, I thought this was America. But on December 6, 2020, Trump tweeted, gee, what a surprise. Has anyone informed the so-called says he has no power to do anything Governor Brian Kemp and his puppet Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan that they could easily solve this mess and win. Signature verification and call a special session, so easy. On December 7th, Trump called Speaker of the Georgia House of Representatives, David Ralston, and asked him to convene a special session of the legislature for the purpose of unlawfully appointing presidential electors in Georgia. The prosecutors alleged that Trump was trying to coerce Ralston, Kemp, and Miller into committing a felony. Then there was the New Year's Eve lawsuit. Uh, Trump's campaign filed several legal challenges in Georgia seeking to throw out ballots or overturn the results. The indictment says that the New Year's Eve lawsuit, which was filed by John Eastman, included statements about mass fraud that Trump knew were false. The statements included the suggestion that dead people, underage people, felons, unregistered voters, and people with P.O. boxes illegally cast votes. The lawsuit demanded that Kemp and Raffensperger decertify the election results, and Trump signed a document verifying that the facts of the complaint were true to the best of his knowledge. Uh, then there was, of course, the perfect phone Phone call. On January 2nd, 2021, uh, 44 days after Biden was declared the victor in Georgia, Trump called Brad Raffensperger and said, quote, I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have because we won the state. And flipping the state is a great testament to the country. I only need 11,000 votes. The indictment says that during the call, Trump made 13 false assertions about election fraud in Georgia. He told Raffensperger that, quote, the ballots are corrupt and you're gonna find that they are, which is totally illegal. It's, it's, it's more illegal for you than it is for them because you know what they did and you're not reporting it. That's a, you know, that's a criminal, that's a criminal offense. And, and you know, you can't let that happen. That's, that's a big risk. To you and to Ryan, your lawyer, that's a big risk. Raffensperger's lawyer, Ryan Germany, told Trump that Raffensperger didn't have the legal authority to conduct another recount, but Trump applied pressure, quote, Brad, what are we gonna do? Uh, we won the election and it's not fair to take it away from us like this. And it's gonna be very costly in many ways. Trump followed up his call by threatening Raffensperger on social media. According to the indictment, Trump's scheme to overturn the election continued at least until September 7th, 2021, when he sent Raffensperger a letter. Trump told Raffensperger that DeKalb County had violated the proper chain of custody procedures for 43,000 absentee ballots. Quote, I would respectfully request that your department check this and if true, along with many other claims of voter fraud and voter irregularities, start the process of decertifying the election or whatever the correct legal remedy is and announce the true winner. As stated to you previously, the number of false and or irregular votes is far greater than needed to change the Georgia election result. Now, as you can probably already tell, Trump and his co-defendants are going to need a good lawyer. If you need a great lawyer, my firm, the Eagle Team, can help. If you or a loved one has suffered from cancer, suffered an injury or death in the family, or were involved in a car crash, we can represent you or help find you the right attorney. Just click on the link in the description for a free consultation with my team, because you don't just need a legal team, you need the Eagle Team. The link is down below. Now, back to Trump. And then there were the computer hackers in Coffee County. 
One of the more bizarre sagas laid out in this indictment is the story of how Sidney Powell coordinated agents in Coffee County, Georgia to hack into voting machines. At the behest of Powell, Kathleen Latham, chairwoman of the Coffee County GOP, and Scott Hall, an Atlanta bail bondsman, met with computer forensics experts from Atlanta firm Sullivan Stricker at the Coffee County Elections Office. Once there, the election official Misty Hampton invited them in, and the conspirators allegedly and on camera accessed the Coffee County voting machines, and in the words of Scott Hall, quote, We scanned every freaking ballot. The indictment alleges that Latham and the others were not authorized by the election board to do this, and that after they imaged the voting machines, they then disseminated the secret voter data from the servers uh, at Sullivan Stricker to other co-conspirators. And then there was the harassment of Ruby Freeman and her daughter, uh, Shay Moss, who were both elections workers. During the January 2nd conversation with Raffensperger, uh, Trump said that Freeman was a scammer who was responsible for fraudulently awarding at least 18,000 ballots to Joseph R. Biden at the State Farm Arena, and allegedly some of Trump's co-defendants traveled from out of state to harass Freeman, intimidate her, and to solicit her to falsely confess to election crimes that she did not commit. For example, uh, Stephen Lee, a police chaplain from Illinois, tried to intimidate Freeman by making a surprise visit to Freeman's home in mid-December 2020. And as you can see on the video, the police body cam footage shows uh, Lee acknowledging that he had knocked on Freeman's door and offered to provide a pro bono service to her. You may want to let her know that you know, I've got some pro bono uh, mm. service for her. Afterwards, uh, Lee allegedly asked Harrison Floyd to arrange a meeting with Freeman to discuss uh, an immunity deal in exchange for false admission of committing election fraud. And Floyd was the director of the Black Voices for Trump. So that takes us to the predicate offenses. The foregoing summary is just the tip of the iceberg here. The indictment goes into much greater detail about the acts uh, that Trump and others allegedly engaged. And this video would be feature length if I went into the, all the detail of the crimes, that, the alleged facts. Uh, but based on the foregoing facts, the co-defendants are accused of 41 different counts. Uh, one of the patterns that you see in this indictment is that it alleges crimes committed by the folks on the ground, and then the very next count is the crimes that allegedly were committed by the leaders of the conspiracy uh, and uh, the ones who would sort of plan things out and coordinate it. Uh, and Donald Trump in particular is accused of committing 13 different crimes. The first was the solicitation of violation of an oath by a public officer. Under Georgia Code Section 16-10-1, any public officer who willfully and intentionally violates the terms of his oath as prescribed by law shall upon conviction be uh, imprisoned. Uh, Georgia law requires public officials to take an oath to quote, support the constitution of the United States and of the state. Uh, the governor, attorney general, secretary of state and members of the state legislature all took uh, the statutory oath upon assuming office. And Trump is accused of soliciting conduct such as altering the results of an election, which arguably violates the oath that Raffensperger, Ralston and others swore. Trump was also charged with violating this section by sending Raffensperger a letter in September of 2021. Then there was the conspiracy to commit impersonating a public officer. Under Georgia Code 16-10-23, a person who falsely holds himself out as a peace officer or other public officer or employee with intent to mislead another into believing that he is actually such officer commits the offense of impersonating an officer. Trump and the defendants unlawfully conspired to cause certain individuals to falsely hold themselves out as the duly elected and qualified presidential electors from the state of Georgia. Trump and the defendants are alleged to have unlawfully conspired to cause certain individuals to falsely hold themselves out as the duly elected and qualified presidential electors from the state of Georgia, public officers, with intent to mislead the president of the United States Senate, the archivist of the United States, the Georgia Secretary of State, and, and the chief judge of the United States District Court for the Northern District of Georgia into believing that they actually were such officers. Uh, then there was the conspiracy to commit forgery in the first degree. In Georgia, a person commits the offense of first degree forgery when with the intent to defraud, he or she knowingly makes, alters, or possesses any writing other than a check in a fictitious name or in such manner that the writing as made or altered purports to have been made by another person at another time with different provisions or by authority of one who did not give such authority and utters or delivers such writing. Here, a fake elector signed certificates falsely certifying that they were duly elected and qualified electors for the president and vice president of the United States of America uh, from the state of Georgia, uh, when that was not true. And count 11 charges Trump with presenting the fake certificate to the archivist of the United States in Fulton County, Georgia. Then there was a conspiracy to commit false statements and writings. False statements and writing is covered by Georgia Code 16-10-20, which states that any person who knowingly and willfully falsifies, conceals, or covers up by any trick scheme or device a material fact, makes a false fictitious or fraudulent statement or representation, or makes or uses any false writing or document knowing the same to contain any false fictitious or fraudulent statement or entry, has committed a crime.
Now, this law differs from the general charge of making false statements in violation of Georgia Code Section 21-2-560 because it does not require an oath and criminalizes any knowing and willful false statements in any matter within the jurisdiction of any state or local department or agency. Now, counts 13 and 19 relate to the fake electoral certificate. Counts 29 and 39 are connected to the Raffensperger call. Count 28 charges Mark Meadows in addition to Trump for solicitation of violation of oath by a public officer for the perfect phone call. And Fonnie Willis could have charged the election fraud version of this crime, but that crime isn't a RICO predicate, which is probably why the more general false statements law was used here. And then there's the filing false documents charge under Georgia code 16-10-21B. Trump allegedly violated these sections by attesting to the facts in the New Year's Eve lawsuit and by filing false elector certificates. So now that we've talked about all of the predicate acts, let's talk about racketeering. Let's talk about what Trump and Young Thug have in common and that is a Georgia RICO charge. Some commentators have had to fall on their swords because this time it is RICO. Fine. It's RICO. Are you happy now? Now, contrary to popular belief, just because something might be a RICO violation on a federal level or a state level, that doesn't necessarily mean that the crimes are more serious or that the defendant faces more jail time. RICO, first and foremost, was a tool created to deal with especially difficult to convict criminal enterprises. Uh, Georgia's RICO law was enacted in 1981, about a decade after the original federal RICO statute, and the Georgia RICO law was modeled on the federal version, which Congress enacted to deal with mafia bosses. Uh, RICO allowed prosecutors to tie mob bosses to the actions of their underlings who carried out the crimes on their behalf. So RICO was created not because it's more strict, but because it's easier to prove in certain situations. RICO can be a way for a prosecutor to send a message. Uh, like conspiracy, it allows you to bring in a lot of evidence and other people that might not otherwise be an explicit part of the crime. And sometimes this can be a good thing and sometimes it can be a bad thing. Uh, in Georgia, RICO cases tend to take a really long time and takes lots of resources, which prosecutors can use as a tool to strong arm some defendants. Now, it's generally easier to convict someone under Georgia's RICO statute than it is under the federal statute. In part, it's because the law is expansive, but also has actual definitions. Now, federal RICO is very complicated. I've actually litigated federal RICO before. And federal courts have adopted a very complicated test that prosecutors often have a hard time meeting. But Georgia courts seem to skirt over this issue. Uh, this is my gloss of what needs to be proven, but the case law is fairly underdeveloped in Georgia. Uh, Georgia Code 16-14-4B states, it shall be unlawful for any person employed by or associated with any enterprise to conduct or participate in directly or indirectly such enterprise through a pattern of racketeering activity. So in other words, a prosecutor has to prove an enterprise, a pattern of activity, and a racketeering activity. Now, the definition of enterprise is extremely broad. As defined by the Georgia Code, enterprise means any person, sole proprietorship, partnership, corporation, business trust, union chartered under the laws of the state or any other legal entity, or any unchartered union association or group of individuals associated, in fact, although not a legal entity, and it includes illicit as well as licit enterprises and governmental as well as other entities. Now, pattern of racketeering activity means engaging in at least two acts of racketeering activity in furtherance of one or more incidents, schemes, or transactions that have the same or similar intents, results, accomplices, victims, or methods of commission, or otherwise are interrelated by distinguishing characteristics and are not isolated incidents within a four-year period. And then finally, racketeering activity means to commit or attempt to commit or to solicit coerce or intimidate another person to commit any crime which is chargeable by indictment under the laws of the state involving basically one of the 43 types of enumerated crimes which we've already talked about and of which there are a lot alleged here. Now, the Georgia indictment lays out a pretty clear enterprise. And in fact, it's the same enterprise, someone running for re-election from the government, uh, that was basically at issue in a case called Caldwell versus State that I'll talk about in just a second. And uh, there are way more than two instances of conduct uh, alleged in the indictment that could form a pattern. And finally, a lot of the alleged conduct could qualify as racketeering activity as it fits within many of the enumerated categories of the RICO statute. Now, Georgia courts have concluded that at least one of the predicate acts for the RICO charge must have been committed in the county in which the criminal proceeding is brought. However, the RICO law lets the government introduce evidence of crimes committed outside of Georgia to prove that there was a wider criminal conspiracy. And that's what the indictment alleges, that Trump and his allies uh, operated a criminal enterprise in Fulton County, but also in other Georgia counties and other swing states. 
Now, the Georgia RICO Act has been used in a wide variety of different cases historically, including uh, charging four people with running an assisted suicide network in violation of state law. It was used to prosecute former DeKalb County Sheriff uh, Sidney Dorsey, who was convicted of masterminding the murder of his successor, who was fatally ambushed in his driveway. Uh, Dorsey was found guilty of murder and racketeering after he organized four men to kill his uh, opponent. Uh, Fawny Willis used it to convict Atlanta teachers in a test cheating scandal involving 180 educators. And Willis is currently pursuing several RICO cases, including a racketeering case against Young Thug and several other rappers affiliated with the uh, alleged street gang Young Slime Life. Now, the expansion of RICO laws has had plenty of criticism. Uh, some people argue that the list of predicate offenses is way too broad. It can also uh, complicate a case by making it more difficult to try. Uh, and Trump will likely argue that the law can't be used against a political campaign. However, there's precedent for using the Georgia RICO Act for corrupt political uh, campaign maneuvers. In an early case called Caldwell versus State, the Supreme Court of Georgia found that RICO applied to an elective office holder seeking re-election, uh, specifically the commissioner of the Georgia Department of Labor. There, uh, Caldwell and 15 employees of the Department of Labor maintained control of the department through a pattern of racketeering uh, consisting of alleged crimes related to the campaign preceding the 1982 election, including theft by deception, extortion, false statements, and false swearing. The court held that, quote, by its expressed terms, the RICO Act includes as a crime a re-election campaign by the holder of public office in which two or more similar or interrelated predicate offenses specified in the act are committed. But there's still some significant issues with parts of the Georgia indictment. While we talked about how non-criminal acts can be overt acts in furtherance of a conspiracy, sometimes non-criminal speech must always remain non-criminal. Uh, unlike the DC indictment, the Georgia indictment includes a lot of activity that's core First Amendment free speech. Uh, even when you are engaged in a criminal conspiracy, you still have the right of free speech. And the DC indictment avoids almost all of that. But by including that kind of speech, parts of the Georgia indictment might be thrown out on First Amendment grounds, or at least complicate things. And some of the alleged crimes seem to go after core political activity as well. For instance, asking legislators to appoint electors. Now, it's one thing to ask public officials to do something that they have no power to do, or is illegal to do, but it's another to ask a legislator to do something that they might actually have the power to do. That could be considered core political activity and that might not be colorable as a crime. And that could be a problem with some of the charges that are alleged here. Uh, but this is again a quagmire that the DC indictment seemed to avoid. And for reasons that I don't have time to go into, there's also a bunch of removal issues that might result in part of the case ending up in federal court. Now here, all 19 defendants were charged with felony racketeering under Georgia's RICO statute, which carries a mandatory minimum sentence of five years if convicted, but those five years can be probation. But the president of the United States does not have power to pardon people for state convictions. So a future president couldn't get them off the hook. And the Georgia governor doesn't have the power either. The Georgia Board of Paroles and Pardons only considers pardons for those who have completed their full sentence obligation and have been free of supervision and or criminal involvement for at least five consecutive years thereafter, as well as five consecutive years immediately prior to applying. But as you can tell, there have been a lot of recent indictments and the only way I've been able to get through them all is with a really good cup of coffee, which is what I get from today's sponsor, Trade Coffee. Now, seriously, uh, I'm gonna need a lot of coffee to get through the next couple of years of Trump news. I think we all will. Uh, but Trade's great, uh, not only because they have a huge selection of your favorite coffees, but they have a fine-tuned matching process that helps you discover fresh coffee based on your taste preferences. I have very specific tastes in coffee. Basically, I want something that tastes like hot chocolate and uh, pairs well with milk. And Trade was able to find me the perfect bean. And let's be honest, you claim you want a rich dark roast, but you really want a coffee milkshake. And either way, Trade has you covered. And don't worry, even though we're in the middle of summer, they have a huge selection of cold brew coffees as well. With Trade, you can discover new coffees from the nation's top roasters, you can choose your coffee, rate it, and your coffee suggestions get even better with time. All conveniently delivered straight to your door, it's really the best coffee website out there. And if you already know what you like, then they probably already have your preferred roaster in stock with a great price. So if you'd like to try Trade Coffee, Legal Eaglets will get their first bag free when they sign up. All you have to do is click on the link that's in the description or the one that's on screen right now. And not only will you get your first bag free, but you'll also get free shipping. So to get your first bag free and free shipping, click on the link that's down below. After that, click on this link over here for more Legal Eagle, or I'll see you in court.